Kenyon Reynolds is going to be the death of me. Hey now, XFL enthusiasts, and welcome to the Rotor Grinders XFL Week 4 preview podcast here at rotorgrinders.com. My name is Chris Gimino, and I am joined by a very special guest coming from Roto World, NFL analyst John Daigle, sidebarring as an XFL analyst. John, welcome to the show. Did you play Cam Phillips this week? I did not play Cam Phillips this week because apparently I'm just a donkey. Uh, we will talk more about the Houston and the Houston offense as a whole as we move along here. Having said that, although I basically gave money away willingly by not playing Ken Phillips on DraftKings, Sunday was a good day. Just the L.A. stack in general presented a, uh, a very good day. It was really fortunate that my Saturday went so, so very poorly because I had originally planned to play 150 Cardell Jones lineups, which, by the way, gives me – the chance to give myself a big giant red clown nose for the week because not only did I not play Cam Phillips but in all but three lineups, not only did I select Cardell Jones as my primary weapon for the week, but I also did not get heavily on Donald Parham, who I felt was probably my biggest mistake of the week. I did, didn't necessarily hate Donald Parham, but I didn't really get behind to the point where we were listing him in our core plays this week, and I just got to take a big fat L, give myself a giant clown nose for not seeing it clear. Same for me. I actually had Flynn Nagel, who could have had a second touchdown had it not been underthrown, which Landry Jones tends to do quite a bit, actually. But I will say, if you got a clown nose, then I certainly got a clown nose because you and I were a lot closer than you think. And I'll elaborate really quickly because on Sunday, I'm looking up at an LA stack and running it back with a DC stack, Rashad Ross and Eli Rogers. And we get those, we get a couple Trey McBride touchdowns. I move into the top five of the big, the big 30K tourney that Dink, of course, eventually Drew Dinkmeyer, the great Drew Dinkmeyer, eventually took down. And I'm looking and I, I'm like, okay, I've, I have a chance actually to take this down with like one more big Trey McBride catch. So it has to all be coming to me. And then I look up and someone – named Chris, also has the same exact freaking lineup. So I'm instead trying to split 15K with you. And, of course, the moral of the story is neither of us got it. Dink took it all down to himself. But just know you and I got clown noses because we had the same exact lineup in the Sunday slate. Yeah, not too hard to do on a two-game slate. I will say that I wish I could say my Trey McBride play was all out of skill. But, of course, we've got something to talk about here in just a second that just – set me off the rails on Sunday. First of all, I, I, I'm losing on Saturday. All my money's going down the drain. I pivot to a bunch of Josh Johnson instead of Cardell Jones. And then, of course, I'm, I'm interested in Saeed Blacknow for some reason. The only even swap on both sides for Saeed Blacknow, once it became clear that he wasn't going to play, thank God for Twitter, by the way, out there doing the Lord's work and figuring yeah. out that Blacknow wasn't going to be in, despite the fact that we didn't have inactives for the game. Because the only player I could play was Trey McBride. and ended up you know, complaining about Trey McBride for three weeks straight, finally getting my chance to play him, and I didn't really want to play him. So there's a lot of teaching tools here that we should discuss in depth. And you started out by saying, yes, the first teaching tool, uh, the XFL. I know we're three weeks in, so I guess there's a little leeway there, but also we're three weeks in. We should have inactives ready to go, especially the game that had, I believe, seven skill players, Los Angeles, uh, this game in general, seven skill players questionable or probable. So we actually needed them in a bad way, and we didn't get them. We had to rely on other Twitter accounts and beat writers on the field at the time. But at that same note, I know I saw Dink actually got asked this on Twitter, and they, people asked, how did you know to get on McBride? And you have to remember, um, at that point, when Blacknall, who I, all, I actually had 100% of um, and had to late swap off of him, uh, at that point, the majority 
I assumed swap to Adonis Jennings. And thus, I'm not playing information anymore. I'm playing people. So rather than going to Jennings, I just blind swapped the Trey McBride trying to get an edge. And so it led me to a good day. Having said that, I think it's just important to remember that, again, it depends on the payout. And if we're playing payouts here, uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. So I just use that to my advantage. And that's why I got on Trey McBride last second. But it benefited the two of us. However, I would still like my, my inactives 30 minutes at least before game time. Please, moving forward. Please. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I've been ranting about Trey McBride for weeks just because I thought he would be one of the stars of this league, and it turns out he might be. Of course, he got concussed in the game. But, look, I, I, it's time to give out another clown nose here, John. I, you know, Vince McMahon is going to get blamed for this by me because he's where the buck stops there with the XFL. Look, I've been a pro wrestling fan, or at least I was back in the day when I was growing up, and I'm going to cut a promo on this guy right now. Oh, yeah, Vince McMahon, you want to start a professional football league, and then you go and do things that aren't professional. Your league is a minor league. You are not competing against the NFL, as you say, but you are competing for eyes against the NBA, the NHL, the PGA, NASCAR, events like Wilder Fury, the NFL Combine, You need the gambling crowd on your side. And if you want the gambling crowd on your side, respect us with information transparency. The fact that these inactives were not posted by 6 p.m. and then later to see that they had posted them at their lock is infuriating. It's disrespectful, John. Not happy with the XFL right now because of this. This is a minor league trying to keep their head afloat. They need the gambling crowd. Give them a big clown nose. Christ. If I had to compare that to a single promo that rings a bell, I think it would be uh, Dustin Rhodes' Hard Times promo. <laughs> we went through some hard times to get there, those inactives, and, but we finally got them seven minutes after kickoff. Unreal. Not, not acceptable. Let's get them some clown shoes too, but I digress. We got to talk about what was going on in the league because the people don't want to hear my takes on the XFL remaining viable and the gambling crowd takes that I'm just spewing out of my mouth uncontrollably right now. They want to know about these teams. Who are these teams after three weeks? How are they using their players? Let's go team by team and let's figure it out. Let's start with the Dallas Renegades. As a team, they're continuing to display a tremendously pass heavy approach. As a result, their yards per play is towards the top of this league, John. What are you seeing when you look at this Dallas team identity-wise? I genuinely think Dallas is the easiest offense to figure out. They they run an air raid scheme, hence why they now have, and Landry Jones' two starts, 86 dropbacks compared to 41 running back carries the past two weeks. And the thing is, Landry Jones hasn't been good downfield. Uh, Just one of 11 for 39 yards and three picks on tosses 20-plus yards downfield. But he's going downfield. And the fact is, this is this offense. This is how they run. We know they prefer to throw the ball and will continue to do so. So these past two weeks, it has strictly been Cameron Artis Payne and Lance Dunbar working in a tandem from the backfield. But Dunbar has 17 targets in that span. Dunbar has 14 carries compared to uh, Cameron Cameron Artis Payne, who is leading the way in this backfield. So although Dunbar is a sneaky play, both on DraftKings and FanDuel, particularly on DraftKings moving forward, because he is more like a wide receiver out of the backfield. Uh, Artis Payne is kind of one of my favorite running backs moving forward, if only because he is out snapping Dunbar. He's out snapped Dunbar 102 to 81 the past two weeks. He's actually ran 11 more routes than Dunbar the past two weeks as well, despite seeing six fewer targets. So if we know he's on the field, more than Dunbar, we can expect those target numbers and carry numbers to continue to regress in his favor moving forward. We're seeing all these heavy pass percent numbers come in each and every week, John, but I think it's really part of the run game, so to speak, to use these backs out of the backfield. And it it certainly helped the past two weeks that Landry Jones does check down quite a bit as well. Um, The fact is they just throw the ball the most in the league. And thus, we'll continue to get everyone involved as long as they're on the field. And their three wide sets are transparent. It's Jeff Bidette, Flynn Nagel, and Donald Pardum, who I know is a big tight end. But, I mean, he's playing 
over 95% of his routes from the slot. So he's not even really a tight end. He's just a big receiver dominating even double coverages at some times. So they'll continue the throwing the ball. And as long as it's the same cemented guys on the field, we know we can trust their workload. Now, they're going to have their hands full this weekend facing off against the Houston Roughnecks who are sacking the quarterback at a high rate. You look at what Dallas has done pass blocking efficiency-wise, though, they've been one of the better pass blocking teams in the league. So it'll be interesting to see who wins this battle. Is Dallas going to be able to continue to throw the ball 70% of the time and be effective, or is this Houston defense going to give them some problems? I, I don't know how it's going to fare, honestly, but I do know that these are two offenses I trust. I trust the approach of Dallas. They're not going to change, I would imagine. And I trust Houston being one of the most efficient offenses in the league. That's why I think this game is going to garner the highest ownership on four game slates on DraftKings and two games. We'll talk about the, the second game on Sunday, the Tampa Bay DC game here in a bit. Yeah, this is a good transition to start talking about the Houston Roughnecks since we're talking about that game. You know, you look at what they have been identity-wise. They've actually been the second pass-heaviest team in the league here as opposed to the Renegades who have been the most pass-heavy, throwing it 69% of the time. Most of their touchdowns have been coming through the air as well. They have definitely not been allowing raw quarterback sacks as far as pass-blocking efficiency is concerned. They've been towards the top of the league and protecting Phillip Walker as well. So if you give this guy a bunch of time to throw – chances are he's going to do some damage as we have seen through three weeks so far. I think that this game is going to be quite the offensive display. I don't see any reason why the Dallas defense is going to give them fits. Do you see it differently? No. And much like Dallas, Houston's three wide sets are cemented. We know it's Cam Phillips, Khalil Lewis on the, on the outside. And then in the slot, it's Nick Hawley who, We're finally done with that whole running back alignment thing that DraftKings and FanDuel tried to get one over on us for a little while there. But for now, um, yeah, I like – how can you not like Houston's offense? How can you not like, quote-unquote, MVPJ and Cam Phillips who are just dominating no matter who they face week in and week out? Having said that, I still think there's reason to put this uh, under the microscope and lean on Khalil Lewis just a hair in this matchup in particular. Because Lewis is actually, he's scored six fewer receiving touchdowns than Cam Phillips. But he has as many targets inside the 10, three, as Cam Phillips. And has seen 22 targets on that team, which is nothing to scoff at at all. So we know P.J. Walker will continue to go downfield and will continue to throw the ball in June Jones' offense. So I do kind of like Khalil Lewis. Um, If you fade Phillips in that case, you're kind of on your own with that one. I can't suggest that. But... Uh, Khalil Lewis, either way, is a sneaky play for me this week in particular. In terms of yards per play, the Roughnecks are the top yards per play team in the league. That's something that I've been monitoring. Like, how efficient are these offenses? And spoiler alert, and no surprise, the XFL offenses are less efficient than NFL offenses. But right. your your Roughnecks are definitely the closest thing. Roughnecks, and like I said, I at least appreciate that Landry Jones is going downfield. So as long as we can map intent, there's no reason to run scared, especially if we think this game will be high scoring for both sides. And knowing that Lance Dunbar and Cameron Artis Payne both get used out of the backfield as receivers, it does leave a myriad of stacking options. Like you could even go It's contrarian, I understand, uh, and it won't correlate, but you could even go Landry Jones, Lance Dunbar, and Cameron Artis Payne, and you could easily shore up all of Dallas' touchdowns that way. Yeah, Philip Walker, speaking of deep balls, is leading the league in deep ball attempts. You know, you look at this, you know, usage for the Houston Roughnecks, it's hard to imagine that they can keep going to Cam Phillips like this every single week. It feels like he's getting the ball every single time. Then you you look up and it's only 28% of targets, which is like not insane by NFL standards. It would be one of the tops in the league, but it's not like it feels like he's getting the ball every time, John. Yeah, and that's why I like Khalil Lewis a lot. Uh, I know for a while there, for two weeks at least, we rode Sammy Coates in three wide sets. And it made sense in week two, given that he got those shots downfield and was more of an air yard servant that we expected to regress positively. But – 
We've now seen two weeks of samples, and his routes run have regressed since week one. He's being used more sparingly now. He's pretty much their fourth receiver, uh, having cut his time with Sam Mobley in the interim. So even Sammy Coates, like, we can probably say he's going to get two shots deep, but that's not something even in tournaments I want to bank on, uh, especially given his hands, honestly. I was making fun of him in chat, Philip Walker, that is, that he can't go left. Like, like every, it felt like every time. It's actually pretty true, yeah. I, I looked at the PFF breakdowns. It wasn't, like, so true that I, I feel compelled to say that this is something that's going to continue. But for sure, he was definitely going right to Cam Phillips. But I think that that's probably just a mirage. And the fact that he dislikes Cam Phillips as his favorite receiver is probably a better explanation for that. The running game for the Houston Roughnecks, James Butler was like the third running back on the depth chart, but all of a sudden he's been in line for a 40 plus percentage of rush attempts every single week. He's not getting a lot of targets. So for me, it's difficult for him to trust him in a, in a league where, you know, you really don't want to play a lot of running backs just the way things have shaken out so far. And there are other running backs who are more heavily involved in the passing game. And that's just it, right? Like you said, he's out snapped Andre Williams 67 to 33 over the last two weeks but he's not really being used in the passing game. So I guess for for two game slates, if you want to get contrarian on FanDuel and try to shore up Houston's touchdowns, let's say a a deep bomb to Cam Phillips falls down inside the five or gets tackled inside the five, and then James Butler plows it in, then that's one way to gain exposure towards touchdowns in this game. It's just just really hard to suggest anyone, anyone try that, knowing you have to luck box your way into two scores. If you want to try to run it back with Philip Walker and Cam Phillips again this week, you will have to pay $23,700 for it on. Oh, boy. They are charging you for this particular combination. So get ready to find someone cheap if you're looking to run it back with Walker and Cam. You can do it. Just uh, not quite as easy as it has been in weeks past. Khalil Lewis, significantly cheaper at 89 I don't think I'm going to have too much interest in James Butler at 7.5. No. And, of course, Sammy Coates on the precipitous decline down to 6.1. And, of course, I will be less on him than I've been all season long, and he will score two touchdowns, won't he? (laughs) That's usually how it works. I guess we should have seen that pricing coming, by the way, because they started hiking up. Nelson Spruce included their salaries last week. So, uh, yeah, of course, they went off the deep end this week. So let's jump into a different team here. Let's talk about the disappointment that we saw on Sunday for the D.C. defenders traveling out to Los Angeles. Boy, that was quite the disaster from Cardell Jones. I'm not going to blame it all on him. His offensive line has given him fits. They they were dead last in pass blocking efficiency last week and for the season. They're still at the bottom of the league. So for me, I'm just not going to be able to trust Cardell Jones in full at any point in time until this offensive line starts to pass block better. What do you make of this situation? So I do this article at Roto World, shameless plug, called Targets and Touches, where I analyze and review the team's usage from the prior week. And it's up every Tuesday morning. So by the time you're listening to this podcast, it may actually be up already on the homepage. And then I, but I tilt it to have an eye towards the following week. So this week it'll be review for week three, previewing week four though um, from a fantasy perspective um, so we can get a leg up on the competition. And last week I actually wrote that I was, I was down on DC's offense coming into this game, if only because it seemed like a sneaky letdown. Um, their first road game of the year, traveling cross country, so circadian rhythm is completely off for them. Um, so it kind of makes sense that they wet the bed. Did I expect them to literally like get stoned and shellacked in LA? No, because that was an outright disaster that led to Cardinal Jones getting benched just to save face at the end of the game. But it was ultimately a letdown. Having said that, this is a road game, but I don't want to comp it the same because body clocks are on the same tune. They're just going to Tampa Bay on the East Coast. They're just going south, in other words. And... I don't know if you want to, I don't know if you're trying to already hyper focus the matchup, but I want to say that last week it made sense for Houston to explode on deep plays against Tampa because they were quietly missing their top two corners and Shelton Lewis and uh, Jalen Collins. 
So this week, I think the injury reports are super important because if those two guys are absent again, and those two guys weren't even close to playing, by the way, then we know Tampa's going to be without their two perimeter corners. And we know Cardell Jones goes downfield at a 20% rate. So we can perhaps get Rashad Ross on cheaper ownership after a letdown game on the perimeter against a third string corner. And we can also get Eli Rogers from the slot. And uh, uh, the third, oh, and then of course, uh, DeAndre Tompkins as well, if you want to go that route. So I do, I do actually think DC's in for a sneaky blow up spot here. Yeah, the usage last week, I'm pretty much throwing it out the window because of the way that week went down. You know, I'm just going to basically throw out this passing game work uh, and not read too much into it. Although we saw Pumphrey get 11% of targets again after getting 13 and 15% in the first two weeks. And now it looks like Jarrell Presley got banged up in that game. He was out with an upper body injury. So if he's not going to be available, Pumphrey is definitely going to project a lot better because I don't think we can expect Nick Brosette, while he did play well at the end of that game, to command a huge share of this backfield. I, I would say just be a little bit careful, though, too, because they are getting Khalid Abdullah mixed in here a little more. And I know DC's last two game scripts now have been a tad wonky, which throws off the numbers um, because they really haven't had to use a 1A, uh, like one primary option in their backfield in competitive game script the past two weeks. So perhaps if this is a close game, then maybe it's all Donnell Pumphrey and they don't put Brissett and Abdullah on the field at all. But what we've seen the last two weeks is they haven't shied away from using four backs. So I would just stress caution and um, I'll be looking at practice reports throughout the week. Yeah, and I'll also be very judicious in my projection for Donnell Pumphrey and not going overboard. If, if in fact, it is going to be Rosette and Abdullah who are also going to be mixing in here on early downs or perhaps uh, as, uh, you know, interchangeable players in this offense, you, know, you definitely don't want to make Pumphrey look like he's going to be a workhorse back. I don't think anyone in this league is going to get that. The only reason I think he becomes relatively safe as an option is just because his target share is going to start eclipsing double digits if it continues on a trend like we've seen over the last couple of weeks. I do want to note that DeAndre Tompkins is exceptionally cheap on DraftKings this week, so that's something to also keep an eye on. He's going to be tempting, albeit, you know, we could also very easily get burned like we saw last week, but I like your analysis on the Tampa Bay secondary as one to attack, and Tompkins could certainly be in for a bounce back spot. Any other usage notes here on the defenders? Yeah, I actually, I'm probably going to go down swinging with this and lose rent again, but I actually like Elon Rogers a lot too. Uh, for you, his usage alone, he's actually run a route on 100% of the defenders' dropbacks the past two weeks and is tied in the league for the third most t targets, 20-plus yards downfield in that span. Um, yes, he does get a few dump-offs on occasion, but Carlos Jones isn't afraid to unleash it to him deep. So I sort of like a double stack between Cardell uh, – Rashad Ross and Eli Rogers, if only because Rogers is someone that would pop if there were a hypothetical air yards model out there. It makes a lot of sense to me. I loved him last week. He obviously did not come through he for us at that time, but bottom line, Viper second in yards per attempt allowed in the league. They are definitely not a team to be feared when it comes to defense in the secondary. So I, I think that Eli Rogers could very easily have a big game here in week number four. Let's move on to Los Angeles, where they were absolutely incredible last week against the defenders on offense. Josh Johnson showed why we thought he might be one of the better quarterbacks in this league. What are you seeing from them identity-wise? Because I'm not so sure that that has actually been established yet. It's going to sound like I'm affected by recency bias, but I actually loved the Wildcats as a dark horse contender before they ran over D.C. at home. Um, cause remember like Josh Johnson didn't play week one. He was, he was out injured. He came back, had to get his rhythm back in week two, but still in the second half pieced together a phenomenal performance and hasn't been shy to throw deep, at least seven deep targets in both, in both the past two weeks. Um, we also know Josh Johnson's only one season removed from being relevant with the Redskins as one of the league's best backups. I know firsthand they had someone, one of their offensive assistants uh, for Los Angeles is actually a scout for the Saints. So they have NFL personnel on hand as well. And they have 
the defensive talent, at least like the Chiefs, where they don't have a, a defense you, to write home about, but they have playmakers that can get it done, both on the defensive line and the secondary. So I actually like Los Angeles a lot. Um, I can freely admit that I actually grabbed some of the shares as they are only – they have the fifth highest favorite for um, – for the championship. And I actually put some money down on that because I do like them quite a bit. And I don't think we've, it's as you've said, because they've been banged up. I don't think we've seen like Los Angeles's full team just yet. I think they're still going. Hopefully they've seen enough of Adonis Jennings, who seems to run all the routes every single week and do absolutely nothing with them. Are you sick of seeing Adonis Jennings run routes for this team? It's going to be interesting because you and I, as we talked about at the beginning, were both on Saeed Black and all, if only because he ran 46 routes in week one and then was inactive. And DeAndre Tompkins is different team, yes, but DeAndre Tompkins' sudden active and availability off the injury report and then just to get thrown in and have a great day fantasy-wise gave me confidence that, okay, now we know in this league, much like the AAF, any player can do this offensively. Um, for any offense if they just suddenly become active again. So I am curious who Black now replaces, if anyone, if he's available in week four. Um, having said that, I will probably go down swinging to find out because I assure you I'll probably go right back to him just to, to take a lofty chance in deep tournaments. We could get fortunate if Trey McBride is in fact concussed. He did get blasted. Uh, kind of a cheap shot almost. It's really not a situation where I'm going to be completely confident in projecting Trey McBride for a whole lot until I see some injury reports. But if Trey McBride is out, obviously that would help anyone's chance in this wide receiver core at getting more targets. Previously and, it wasn't. I, no, I was just saying, by the way, um, this is sort of a similar spot that DC was just in. Like Los Angeles now travels cross country this week to play New York. And I understand New York cannot move the ball whatsoever. Um, and, and LA, you know, I, I haven't seen a line just yet when we hopped on for the podcast, they hadn't released lines as far as I could find, but it's sort of a scary spot for LA's offense. I can see a low scoring game here. If only because, um, the matchup doesn't fare too well offensively for them. Yep. And, you know, Nelson Spruce fell off a little bit this week. I do expect him to continue to be a heavily involved piece of this offense in the second half. He picked up the pace, so I'm not worried about his share dropping, you know, Trey McBride was obviously getting targeted heavily in the first half, but I feel, I feel like things would even out there. I have it projected at something like 23, 24% of targets for Nelson Spruce at the moment. I feel like you could even be a little bit less conservative than that with him. I just assume he's going to be the number one target here, even with Trey McBride playing well. And if, if all of Jennings, Spruce, McBride, and Blacknow are all active, um, I really don't know what to tell you. I have no idea. Well, to say the least, we can look at Josh Johnson as a favorable option here for sure if we get all these guys back because he can clearly get it done still even at his advanced age for NFL football. You look at the backfield, though, Martez Carter, baby. You saw it coming, right? <laughs> I did not. He was one of three backs active. Like The moment we started seeing that Elijah Hood wasn't on the field for warm-ups, we pretty much knew they were going to use three backs, Martez Carter, Larry Rose, and Dewan Harris. Um, I shied away from that situation because I genuinely didn't he even have a lean for an edge. I had, I had no idea. And quite frankly, it's sort of scary for Eli Elijah Hood, who's probably eyeing returning in week four, because Marquez Carter looked pretty good. Oh, there's no question he's going to get some snaps now. I don't see how you could watch that and then not put the guy back on the field for at least a couple. Winston Moss actually came out after the game in his press conference and said they're going to use a back by committee. So it's just a matter now if they only use three backs and healthy scratch Jawan Harris or Larry Rose, or if they give us a complete nightmare and make all four available. It's a, it's a four game slate every week. And it feels like there's like 10 because every single team has like nine options. It's like pretty crazy how spread out all the work share is on every single team. I could use a committee that is a little bit more consolidated than four right now, John. All right, let's talk about the identity really quickly of their opponent this week, the New York Guardians. Look, it hasn't been good. They've been allowing 6.77 yards per attempt. Doesn't sound that like that much, but in this league, it's been one of the tops. So I'm not looking at this as an efficient defensive unit. They were supposed to have a couple of good cornerbacks, but I think overall, you know, this is a defense that is not to be feared. 
Yeah, it's Jamar Summers, their their number one corner, I still believe is a a really good player. Um, it's just this offense isn't giving them any help whatsoever. Let's go ahead and talk about the New York Guardians. This is a team that has struggled several weeks in a row. They came out pretty strong in week number one, but since then they have looked like probably the worst team in the league in the last two weeks. So mm-hmm. the question is, if one of these quarterbacks can stand up and actually start playing competent football, can this offense revive itself? Matt McGloin wasn't a NFL backup. He wasn't an NFL third string. So to crown him the starter and think you can continually run him out, um, despite the fact he's now averaged 5.3 yards per attempt and a touchdown in three picks through three games, it's, it's pretty atrocious. I would like to see Marquise Williams, if only because he adds rushing ability. And in this league, the, the ability to extend the play is almost everything. Um, you even see uh, Jordan, Jordan Ta'amu um, getting out there. And I don't think he has the best arm for St. Louis, but at least he extends every single play, no matter the pressure he's dealt, dealt with. So I would just like to see another option besides Matt McGullin, quite frankly, to trust anyone on this offense. Um, But Joe Horn was the surprising scratch for week three, which let Austin Duke take over in the slot. Having said that, Austin Duke only played 15 snaps, and most of his production really didn't come when the game was competitive because, as it turns out, most games aren't competitive for New York. So if Joe Horn's back, that's interesting because at least we know he led the team in targets and target share through two weeks before going down injured. Uh, a player I, I like, I just don't know. I don't think he's worth chasing. Um, you saw Justin Stockton, right? He didn't even take a carry in the game, but he definitely looked decent out of the backfield. But I, I don't know. Isn't this another three-person committee that we're just like running Frizzy Hills from? Totally. And that's just it. That's why I wanted to say is that I like Justin Stockton a lot. I liked him in the AAF, but he got five targets. He only played seven snaps. Like we know we can't count on that hyper efficient usage to continue five targets on seven snaps. And Matthew Colburn, who was injured and scratched for this game was previously their pass catching back. So if Colburn pops up, uh, or it returns to health, then we know he's pretty much going to split limited time with Justin Stockton or maybe Justin Stockton just stays playing limited snaps and you have to depend on hyper-efficient efficient usage again, which you don't want to do. So while I like him, like you said, he's just someone we really can't trust in this backfield that typically can't be used because they're playing from behind. For the most part, this running back situation, until it consolidates, is probably a stay away, as you mentioned. Now, in the passing game, you talked about Joe Horn. You talked about Marquise Williams. I actually have Luis Perez projected right now as the starter for this week. I don't know if that'll be the case. He did lead them on a touchdown drive. That's like really the one thing I'm hanging my hat on. And of course, McGloin could be injured or he could be benched. I'm leaning towards injured at this moment in time. Where where do you see this going if it is Luis Perez at quarterback? I mean, I, I watched every AAF game. So I've seen Luis Perez play football and it's not the prettiest thing. And that's coming. And so how, how he ended up on the same team with, Matt McGloin is actually quite frightening. Uh, Louis Perez attempted the second most passes in the AAF for the Birmingham Iron, but actually finished 14th in completion rate. And mind you, there are only eight teams. So imagine this, 14th in completion rate and 15th in QBR in a league with only eight teams. So it's not really like you want to hang your hat on this offense anymore if it's Louis Perez under center. He's going to launch balls. He, was, he finished second among quarterbacks, I believe, in total air yards. So he's not scared to throw downfield. But at the same time, he's just not accurate at all, and he can't hit them. So it's still, if you play anyone, I would personally only lean on Mikhail McKay for his behind-the-box score usage because McKay has run a route on 100% of the team's dropbacks, no matter who has been under center. So we know he's going to be on the field at the very least, whether Austin Duke or Joe Horn are taking over in the slot. So that really, for me, is the only person I would uh, depend on in this offense. Bottom line is, I, I don't have a lot of faith in pretty much anyone here. Of course, on DraftKings, they, we live in the world of the salary cap. The player that I do hope does end up coming back and getting his usual share, or at least what we think is his usual share, is Joe Horn, because he's just 3.9 this week. 
that would end up being a pretty good value, even if you're conservative with the projection. On FanDuel, I believe he's $10 on the two-game slate. And as we know, minimum is $8. So it's actually not too high either. All right, let's get on talking about the Seattle Dragons, who they are the most boring team in the XFL <laughs> juncture. I mean, we know what they are. They use all three backs. That's, and at least they've been consistent with it, so we know to shy away from it. Through three games, Kenneth Farrow, 76, 76 snaps, 23 carries. Trey Williams, 61 snaps, so 15 fewer, but only 22 carries, so only one fewer. And then Jaquan Gardner, 54 snaps, 27 carries, which is a team high, a backfield high. Uh, Gardner isn't being used in the passing game, but both Williams and Farrow are. So all they do is cannibalize one another every single week, and this Jim Zorn offense still loves to run the ball. And they don't do it creatively like the Battle Hawks, who we'll talk about soon. Um, they just run the ball up the middle. So the only person I've really been depending on, honestly, is Keenan Reynolds, because much like Mikael McKay, Keenan Reynolds has run a route on every single drop back for this team. And Keenan Reynolds has actually run more routes than Austin Prohl. Uh, Austin Prohl, I understand, has leads this team with three receiving touchdowns and lead, and is number five, I believe, in receiving yards in the entire league. But Keenan Reynolds has actually seen one more target than him. So I still prefer moving forward, depending on Reynolds over Prohl. Uh, I like I like Silvers honestly, probably slightly more than you. Just the fact is, they don't let him go downfield enough. They like running the ball, and that's going to continue happening. Yeah, I also watched a lot of AAF, and I just, you know, Silvers didn't really impress me a ton there. I, I haven't seen a lot here in the XFL that's made me change my mind. But this offense is definitely not doing him any favors, 55% passing only for this team. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, not even the lowest in the league, which is crazy. But, you know, there, there's just not a lot of meat on the bone here for Silvers. His projection is low every week as a result. And this individual matchup in week four is not too strong for him against the Battlehawks. They don't let you go deep, so if, if you're relying on the deep ball to try to get you some explosive offense from a team that doesn't like to throw it a lot, I don't think you're going to find it here against the Battlehawks. Kenyon Reynolds is going to be the death of me. Let's move on. Oh, my God. I, I didn't <laughs> want to say anything, John, but, like, Kenyon Reynolds has to be – like, he's just like molasses out there. I just – I can't even you – don't, You don't think he looks good? I actually think he looks pretty good. His one yeah. deep ball to the corner of the end zone last week was underthrown. He tried to come back and get it. It was just a bad ball. You know what it is? I look at his player profiler numbers and it's like like a 20th percentile speed score or something like that. Oh, I'm unfairly see, biased by the internet. See, with the XFL, you can't look at player profiler because all of them run like molasses. It's all relative. <laughs> like 20 percentile spark score is a freak in the XFL. All right, let's talk about the St. Louis Battlehawks who absolutely destroyed the Guardians last week, the huge home crowd did them some favors as far as getting the momentum. The running back duo of Matt Jones and Christine Michael absolutely plowed ahead as expected here. What are you seeing identity-wise here for these Battlehawks? The Battlehawks are interesting because they run a ton of plays uh, and they run the ball when they run a ton of plays. But uh, it, and they, they lend itself for the opposing offense thus to run more plays too, but it's not really done sexy, right? Um, Christian Michael, I mean, Christine Michael, I should say, just my God, I cannot believe, and I'm sure he's a terrific person, don't get me wrong, I just cannot believe more teams continue giving him more chances when he continues to do absolutely nothing. 35 carries, 82 yards and a touchdown, 2.3 yards per attempt, and has a three-to-one lead on Matt Jones for carries inside the tent. Matt Jones has been far and away the batter back, yet they have yet to shy away from just a timeshare up and down, which leads players to sometimes playing both to, to get an edge on the field. Um, having said that, something interesting actually happened in the passing game this week, and I don't think we saw it come to true fruition because they didn't need to drop back Jordan Tom, who – uh, over 30 times, right? He only dropped back 22 times, and he was pressured five times, sacked twice on those 22 dropbacks. And I think it's because their left tackle, Jake Campos, who hadn't allowed a single pressure 
on 100 offensive snaps, uh, was placed on injured reserve quietly in the middle of the week prior to kickoff. So, and he was arguably the best left tackle in the league. Like I said, no pressures, no sacks, a clean sheet through two games. Uh, and now they don't have him moving forward. So I am curious to see in a competitive game, we know Tamu has the ability to run around and extend the play. But if he's going to be under pressure constantly, it does make this offense scarier, especially because we haven't seen a wide receiver really like open himself and become the true 1A option on a weekly basis yet. It's interesting that the backs in this offense, while they are seemingly in control of the offense, you know, they, they run it 58% of the time. Mm-hmm. That is incredible. They, they run it 58% of the time, but yet these backs are not involved in the passing game. It was 4% week one, 3% week two for Matt Jones, 4% week number one for Christine Michael, 6% week number two. It's not really looking like these guys are going to be a big part of what they do in the passing game unless this has just been a three-week fluke. But they run the ball inside the 10, and we don't know which one will get the ball inside the 10. So unfortunately, Matt Jones and or Kristen Michael, like they've kind of become weekly staples, either choosing one or picking both. Certainly, you mentioned that the passing game doesn't really have an identity as far as a true number one. Ultimately, it does still seem like you'll see DeMornay Pearsonell be involved in the offense each week, and that's probably the spot I would look to if Price wasn't a thing. Unfortunately, on DraftKings, each and every week, they're recognizing that he's been the most involved. You don't – see, I'm the opposite way, actually, um, because, you know, he exploded for that team-high 11 targets and nine catches for 50 yards and a touchdown in week two. But to me, he was a clear fade candidate on Sunday – because in week two, he actually only ran the fourth most routes for St. Louis. And this past week, he ran the fifth most routes and thus came crashing back to earth with three catches for 25 yards. So Pearson L, although he was a standout player in the AAF, uh, he made Oakland's team, didn't, uh, obviously didn't do much with Oakland, but he still made the NFL this past year. Um, he's just being used as a committee guy, so that's kind of why I've been sh- shying away from him. Yeah, I feel like that that's true, that he's definitely coming on and off the field. But I also think that when he comes on the field, he's coming on the field with purpose. This past week, they didn't really need him too much. So I'm reserving, I'm reserving my judgment as far as what his role is on a week-to-week basis. But I do recognize what you're saying is true and that there is definitely a reason to be wary at 9500 which is his price on DraftKings this week. That's not going to cut it. Right. That's fair. All right. You talk about the Seattle Dragons as a defense. Do you have any notes about their defense that would be interesting as far as how we would deploy the Battlehawks on offense? Uh, Unfortunately, no. Do you have a line yet by any chance? Have you seen one for this game? No, I'm with you. I have not seen lines for week number four. So last week, whenever – like we know the New York offense. And so St. Louis, uh, it just made sense to play Matt Jones or to play both Matt Jones and Michael. Um, So if this game is – somewhat projected to be close because the lines have actually been pretty tight. They've been pretty close. Bookmakers have been good about that. So I am curious to see this line um, because maybe it does lead us to lean on Matt Jones, but perhaps we can just get away from both because as you stated earlier, we know they're not going to be used in the passing game either. Let's get into the final team here. Let's talk about the Tampa Bay Vipers. Vipers are going to play the DC defenders this week. And this is a team that finally woke up and put some offense together. But it sounds like Aaron Murray is going to be back in the fold. And I don't know if like yet another quarterback changes exactly what they need now. How are you reading the identity of the Tampa Bay Vipers coming into this game? Yeah, we don't know really what's going to happen at quarterback. We just know that Quentin Flowers has looked explosive. But for whatever reason, they didn't play him at all in the second half after he actually led them to a touchdown. So – We'll have to wait and see what Tressman says throughout the week. What we do know is that Tressman actually handed over offensive play calling to OC Jamie Elizondo, and what happened is that they ran more 11 personnel with their top three receivers who ended up being Daniel Williams, Jalen Tolliver, and Maurice Horn. Now, there are a lot of moving pieces here, a lot, because Shontavious Jones was released midweek. He was an air yards guy. So that he's now free. I believe he's on team nine, free to sign anywhere. 
SJ Green, who they traded for um, ha- from Seattle, wasn't active. So if he plays, maybe he cuts into someone's time. And then obviously their number one tight end, Nick Trusdale, who was an amazing player in the AAF, he was inactive. Uh, he was banged up as well. So if Truesdale comes back, I would think he just takes over for DeAndre Goolsby, and we still get three wide sets with Dan Williams, Tolliver, and Reese Horn. But SJ Green being involved maybe throws a wrench into something. Um, either way, Williams and Tolliver in particular are guys I'm interested in this week. Yeah, I'm curious about SJ Green. I don't have a lot of confidence that he's going to be a big-time player in this league. He wasn't capable of sticking with the CFL. You know, he's he's sort of an older guy. So, I mean, I know he knows Trestman's scheme. I know this is a league where maybe you don't have to be the best athlete in the world to find success. You know, certainly Cam Phillips isn't any kind of a dreamboat athlete out there crushing people right now. But Green is a player that even if he is involved, you know, I, I feel like it might be just a little bit of quote-unquote uh, XFL nepotism here, don't you think? Probably. I think, though, little things like this, including uh, – and on four game slates, especially like these little things are perhaps make or break you. Like maybe we're here today splitting 15 K uh, if we do something else, right? So I just think all these little notes add up. So maybe SJ green, who was a legend in the CFL, maybe he doesn't mean anything at all. And Tampa Bay has finally entrenched their three wide sets. Cause if so, that'd be great. Cause at least Taylor Cornelius showed a little bit of promise throwing deep this past week. And if now he's on the field, for a majority of snaps, for like at least three quarters, that's, uh, that's pretty good. But I guess we're going to have to wait and see because until then, at the very least, we know who the three wide receivers are going to be. The backfield is a little bit easier to judge here in Tampa Bay because you have Devion Smith, you know, roughly 40% or so of the carries every week. You've got Jock Patrick somewhere between 30 and 40% of the carries every week. And both of these guys have some sort of a role in the passing game with Smith actually getting 12% of the targets this week and coming about 14 inches short of a touchdown. So for me, looking at the Smith versus Patrick work share, as long as they're priced affordably, they could be somewhat useful in DFS. Agree. Uh, Patrick, I know, was only 4,400 last week. And that sort of came back to bite people who used him, if only because he wasn't used in the passing game often and got out snapped by Devion Smith. But both both have been pretty effective. We just need them to get a competitive game script like they had last week, and then we can really see how this backfield will shake out. 6.1 for Smith this week, 5K for Patrick. So we could be in line here to have another – week where we're taking a look at these running backs for value because there's not, you know, DraftKings is now starting to get more efficient with these prices. And it looks like you're just not going to find these completely obvious plays week in and week out. You know, even Jalen Tolliver is up to 6K now. We mentioned all the reasons that that work share could start to get split for a number of different reasons differently than what we saw last week. Oh, I was going to say, and for whatever it's worth, um, Jock S. Patrick actually has five carries inside the 10 yard line and one target. So six opportunities, whereas Devion Smith only has three. That's interesting. Yeah. And so Patrick being the cheaper player, you know, you want to swing your lineup with those high value touches and touchdown that is play, certainly yeah. a great way to get there. You talk about the defense for the defenders. You know, you saw Dinkmeyer do the classic tweet. I thought they were called the defenders. What happened to them last week? And do you think that the Vipers can once again get something done on offense? I do, uh, especially because as we've seen in the XFL, it's been in favor to be play at home. And so now we get them at home. So while I do think DC's offense bounced back, as we talked about in depth earlier, uh, I do like Tampa Bay to hang, especially if Elizondo continues calling plays, which I'd imagine he does. We're going to have to wait and see what happens with Cornelius and Flowers, and I guess Murray for that case. But with Cornelius under center, I at least think they they can show some promise. And remember, he targeted just last week uh, Daniel Williams. Oh, I'm sorry, the past two weeks, he's actually targeted Dan Williams four times, 20-plus yards downfield, despite the fact that Williams has only totaled 57 receiving yards in that span. So while Tolliver went over 100 yards last week, I think that Williams is in store for some positive regression if you want to trust the Tampa Bay offense. All 
I, I think overall, week number three did actually start to spin things a little bit more wacky than we'd seen in previous weeks. We start to think we know something about these teams. You think the Vipers are one thing, but they're not going to score. They end up getting it done. You think the defenders are one of the best teams in the league, and all of a sudden, you know, they're able to get stomped by Los Angeles on the road. You think that a team like the Vipers is somewhat competent on defense, and maybe Philip Walker's not going to absolutely trounce all over them, and sure enough, he puts up a 40 spot on them. So, to me, I think that the XFL is starting to get more exciting as injuries start to set in. Do you have any like larger takeaways for the league as we move into the middle stages of the season? I wouldn't even say if you have don't have a good quarterback, you're already you're already sinking. I think you just need a quarterback that extends plays because that's why to a certain extent, unless it tilts egregiously one way or the other, I haven't even really been paying attention to pressure stats because I don't expect any offensive line to protect anyone. And that's kind of how it's been through three weeks. Uh, offensive line play is just poor because continuity is very important with offensive lines from year to year. That's why we have some people in the industry tracking it from year to year in the NFL. So for these guys to get slapped together for one preseason game and then for just a couple quote unquote regular season games and to expect to protect for multiple quarterbacks in some cases who they have only seen on at under second string reps it's pretty tough so I would just say as long as a guy can extend plays then you can compete to win this league and then it certainly helps that we already have a few guys that not only can extend plays but they already stand out as playmakers um, like you I have questions about Cardell Jones having said that he's obviously a good fit for this league and he's in the top half of their quarterbacks. So at the very least, D.C. are contenders, if only because he has shown promise. John, you mentioned earlier that you are going to put together a usage article. Where can the people find it? Uh, it will be on the Roto World homepage every single Tuesday morning, as it's been so far. It's called Targets and Touches. So you can go there. And then also you can follow me on Twitter at the world's worst Twitter account handle, at not Jay Daigle, because in 2009, when I picked it up, I figured I wanted to stay anonymous. And here we are in the industry where I can't stay anonymous nearly a decade later, or I guess over a decade later. So uh, yeah, at Not Jay Daigle, we're, I don't really tweet about XFL, to be quite honest. And I only tweet information. I don't tweet much memes. So it's not even a fun account, but it's there. If you want information, it's certainly there. His Twitter handle may not be brilliant. But you are doing yourself a complete disservice if you do not go find this XFL usage article if you're going to play this week and read every word of it. Because I can assure you there's going to be something to be learned here, even things that we didn't cover on this broadcast. That is going to do it for the week four usage and identity pod here at rotogrinders.com. I want to thank you for listening. For John Daigle, I'm Chris Tremino. We will be back once again for the late week game-by-game -game breakdown on Roto-Grinders Premium. Until then, have a great week. <laughs>